We welcome Ken Burns and Lisa Napoli to Live Talks Los Angeles. They'll discuss storytelling, Ken Burns' career in documentary filmmaking, and his new book, Our America, A Photographic History. We'll also include some pictures from the book. Ken is a producer and director who founded Florentine Films, his documentary film company, in 1976. His numerous films, film series include The Vietnam War, The Roosevelt's, and Intimate History, The War, and the U.S. and the Holocaust. His landmark film, The Civil War, was the highest rated series in the history of American public television. And his work has won numerous prizes, including the Emmy and Peabody Awards and two Academy Award nominations. Lisa has a long career in journalism, including staff reporting jobs at Public Radio's Marketplace, the pioneering New York Times Cyber Times, and as a columnist and correspondent at MSNBC. She is the author of four books, most recently, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR. Both, incidentally, are graduates of Hampshire College. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I will let you take it from here, Lisa. Thank you, Ted. Yeah, in fact, Ken, I'll tell you the story in a bit about how I first saw you at Franklin Patterson Hall in probably 1981 oh, um, okay. when you were screening the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, but, my goodness. That's, yeah. so <laughs> That's so great. I was long gone, six years gone, but I had to bring it back to my alma mater. Oh, and yes, you were a rock star then, so even <laughs> more so now. But I, I was, I was thinking as Ted was explaining, I, I'm mostly a biographer now, so I mostly text. But you, I hadn't even thought about you really beginning your career as a photographer. And I was thinking about how when some future documentarian goes to make the Ken Burns definitive biography years and years from now when we're all gone, they're gonna have to start with a photograph of you as a little boy with your dad in a dark room with the first camera that he gave you because that's really where it all started. So could you set that scene for us? Yeah, I mean, I wish there was a photograph of that. My earliest memory is of, of my dad building a dark room in a, the basement of our tract house in a development in Newark, Delaware. He was the only anthropologist in the entire state of Delaware. And just a few seconds later, that film clip of memory jumps to being in his his left arm as his right hand was manipulating the tongs and the smells and the eerie red light and looking at this incredible magic. He was an anthropologist, but an amateur uh, photographer, and he took really good good photographs. And so I had that, but I wanted to be a filmmaker from age 11. My mom passed away. And the first time I saw my dad cry was when he showed me a movie uh, a half a year afterwards. And he hadn't cried when she was sick for many years, eight years, hadn't cried when she died, hadn't cried at the funeral, which everyone kind of noticed. But there was this medium film that was giving him safe haven. And so I, I wanted to be a feature filmmaker. Of course, that's what it meant. And then I ended up at Hampshire College in the fall of uh, 71 in the second year of its existence. And all of my teachers were social documentary still photographers. So I was coming back to my roots and rediscovering that. And, and essentially, I've not lost the narrative interest in telling stories. I've just shifted it to documentary and shifted it to the past where the evidence of the past, particularly the DNA of my work is a still photograph, no matter how abundant the, the, the movie, the, the footage is. Um, that's, that's how we, how we play the game. And it's kind of the DNA of what I do. And it, it goes back and this book has been, you know, gestating for years and years and years. And I've been talking about it and thinking about it because it's a way to go back and honor the two teachers, my father, and I've had many, many mentors. They've been for fortunate, but the two most important for this work, my father and, and Jerome Liebling, mm -hmm. um, my professor at Hampshire College. I, I will talk more about how the book, the genesis of the book in a moment, but let's talk a little bit more about Jerry Liebling because he yes. is, you dedicate the book to, like you say, to him and your dad. And I want to know what happened at Hampshire. You know, Hampshire was a scrappy upstart school with no equipment. There you are, you had this vision, you had lost your mother, you, you wanted to honor your dad by becoming a filmmaker. What did Jerry Liebling do or say that convinced you or gesticulated all of what well you first of all he he's a true mentor and, and in the beginning he was terrifying it was his young associate who he had brought from minnesota where he had come from university of minnesota elaine mays who's her in, a, in and of herself an extraordinary photographer and she became 
closest to us. And Jerry was always the unapproachable figure. And then I approached him and something happened. Um, it It is very, very rare. It felt like it was, I was back in the Renaissance. I felt like there was somebody, and I'm not the only person. It wasn't some special light that was right. shining. On me. There are dozens of people out there who would say, oh man, Jerry transformed me. And it wasn't just in the classrooms where all film and photography was combined. And it kind of seems superficially, yes, but it doesn't happen everywhere. So he's putting up photographs, other photographers are putting up photographs, I'm putting up meager photographs, but we're bringing film footage and we're talking about stuff and we're seeing films and we're going to exhibitions and you're learning as much from him when his car breaks down and he wants you to drive him to Northampton to go pick up his dry cleaning and you go and you do this or at his home where he invites people in and we're just learning. And, and we stayed friends until the end. I, I mean, I remember one particular moment when I was working on my final project in Division Three, I don't need to explain it to you, um, at Hampshire, which is a film for Old Sturbridge Village, the Living History Museum in central Massachusetts. And everything about it had been form informed by what Jerry had taught us. And I was sharing with him a kind of somewhere between a rough and a fine cut. And at one point he sort of stopped and he said, no, 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 I think you should do it this way. And I went, no, I'm gonna do it this way. And he pushed and I said, no. And then he pushed and I said, no, and then he let go. And I felt like I was just jumped out of an airplane without a parachute because I realized that I had developed my own set of something and that he had seen that and realized I was gonna go. What was so great is that until he passed away in 2011 and I honor him with a little shrine in my kitchen, um, we remain the best of friends. I mean, I, he was like a father figure to me as well and and such an amazingly uh, influential human being. I, I cannot say enough, which is why his beautiful photograph uh, graces the cover of the book and why yes. it's dedicated to him along with my dad. Let's talk another second, though, about this concept of listening to pictures that you talk about in the yeah. book and the whole idea of the Ken Burns effect now immortalized by Apple so we can all steal it. But how 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 did that come about when you were when you were studying with Jerry and when you had gone off to form Florentine Films with this other core group of people? Um, all in, from Hampshire, yeah. All from Hampshire, and Elaine Mays was there with you, giving the name to the company. What what was it about pictures as opposed to moving images that stuck with you? Was it that root in photography, or I think I think it was, and I think it was this latent and untrained and completely untutored uh, interest in history, which I've always had. I mean, the last time I took an American history course was in eleventh grade. You know, when they make you take it, and everybody mm -hmm. hates it. Um, the only the last course in history I, I took was Russian history in, at Hampshire. So I just it, it had been informed me American history had been a part of me. So here was an opportunity to do history and to do it in a new way. And that meant not holding an, a still photograph, which was used for filmmakers until thank goodness we can get a newsreel. And, and I said, no, why don't we treat the, the, the still photograph as if it was the wide shot that the filmmaker that I always, the feature filmmaker that I always wanted to be had. And so it had a, a you know, a master shot, a, me, a long shot, a medium, a close up, a tilt, a pan, a reveal, you could isolate details. And so I just felt it was important to have an energetic camera eye. And as I began to, to work on this, as my professional life began, I began to realize I was listening to the photographs too. And I hadn't really realized that. I had been caught unaware that I was affecting them as I was shooting them through the camera, you know, putting them up on an easel with magnets and then going back with a fixed lens and shooting and then moving up closer or then making a copy print and taking it to an animator in those days, you know, one click and then every four things got adjusted another click and if you do 24 of those clicks you have one second and if you do 240 of them you have 10 seconds and you got to get the move right it was endless and then it got digitized and got a little bit quicker and now everything's within the, the programs but there was something so intimate about being in the camera that i realized i was hearing the horse whinny or the the leaves in the trees ru rustling or the or the uh, cannon firing, or the guns, muskets going off, or the the bat cracking, whatever it was, it was it was animating, and that's what I brought to my work. So when Apple does the Ken Burns effect, it's just a simple kind of pan, zoom, dissolve, 
you know, slight pan, slight zoom in, slight pan out, <laughs> dissolve. And ours is a much more complicated thing. And and I, you know, I I talked and spent a lot of time with Steve Jobs when he did it and asked his engineers to do it and asked me to give the name. And I said, oh, I don't do commercial endorsements. But we ended up making out a deal where I gave a lot of hardware and software away to nonprofits. And that made me feel um, good about it. But it's it's not the complex thing of trying to really wake the dead, to try to animate what has been passed. More importantly, to trust that that single photograph was the arrested memory of a, a longer thing. That is to say that horse mm -hmm. and buggy had started out a frame and had gone through it rather than just be in it. So you you had a sense of, of, of asking questions of the past, you know, who is that person? What do they do? Who do they love? What happened? Where does the sorrow come from? Where does the joy come from? Who built that uh, that carriage? Where's that horse? How old is that horse? What kind of horse is that? In addition to all of these visual and auditory questions that, that you're having. And that makes for a dynamic that then we've applied in all the films, even when we've had an abundance of, of motion picture, say in Vietnam or World War II, if you look at our introductory part, the kind where we sort of stop and say, this is sort of what the film is going to be for the next seven episodes or the next 10 episodes in the case of Vietnam, it's all done with stills. And it, it, it is the beginning. And, and of course, the persistence of vision that human beings have, a physiological condition, means that when we look at something, we are seeing 24 separate still photographs, each for a 48th of a second, every second, and the other 2448s, the other half second is black. As hmm. the shutter comes down, pulls the frame down and the next frame in. And that because we are not quick enough which, with our perceptive apparatus, we are unable to disconnect those into single photographs. And so we see motion. And that's uh, in, in motion picture. We of course see motion with our eyes, but the reason why film works is because of that persistence of vision. And it all begins with Moybridge, right? Who's taking those pictures, still images that begin to suggest that that horse, that man, that dog is going to go into motion. And it's, um, it's pretty exhilarating, even at that basic atomic level that I've just described. Mm -hmm. And then when you add layers of meaning and interpretation and story and narrative and complicated narrative, that isn't just binary, good guys, bad guys, but is, is complicated. There's no um, villain that is completely villainous, no hero that's completely virtuous. Then you've got the tools for real, I think, storytelling of a, of a certain kind. Well, that was, that was another thing I've wondered for years now. Why is it that you veered off, you could have become a documentary photographer, a news photographer. Instead, you chose film, which as you're saying, is all these complex elements and people, other people. You can't just work in a solitary vacuum as a, right. as a filmmaker, especially of the kind that you are. There's so much right. research and, um, and, and stitching together in a yeah. different way than if you're making stuff up. So how, what, what was it? Was it Jerry? I never, I never thought of myself ever as a still photographer oh. or wanting to be. I, I was informed my whole childhood and, and into adulthood and to this moment, you know, uh, I'm 69 uh, by still photographs. And so that's the DNA, but there was never a sense that that was something I wanted to pursue. I wanted to be a filmmaker. That's what I wanted to be. And so it was just the question of these choosing influences or having those influences work on me without my conscious understanding, like Jerry, like Elaine, like Hampshire, uh, like my dad before that, all of those things combined. And I had a brownie camera and I took pictures and I was interested in that. And for a time in college, I, I was serious about it. We developed our work, we made prints, you know, but it wasn't, it was always going to be about making films. So I and, and I think I wanted the society, I'm very private, and I wanted the society that comes, as you suggest, from collaboration. These films mm -hmm. that say a film by Ken Burns are not, even though I might have four or five or six jobs in it, you know, 
they're not made alone. And that's a glorious part of, uh, it's an orchestra, not not a soloist art. And and I, I love that part of it. And I love the the community, the us of it, you know, in, in the, the member of the wedding, Carson McCullough's great novel, uh, the young protag uh, protagonist, Frankie, a young girl, her older mm -hmm. sister is getting married and she's jealous. And she says, they will have the we of me. And I like the people that I've worked with for the last 50 plus years because they're the we of me. Yes. And now we can say one word about your late wife, your, your yeah. ex-wife yeah. who just passed away. And her obituary was so moving in the New York Times, as was their choice of using your quote at the end of it, where you said, I'll paraphrase, I wouldn't be who I am without. Yeah, Amy no, is, and yeah. it's true of a lot of people. But yeah, we particularly miss Amy right now. She's the mother of my two of uh, four daughters, and mm -hmm. they're spectacular filmmakers in their own right right now. And uh, and and the mothers of my grandchildren. And uh, yeah, she was a remarkable person, and kind of. Uh, I'm if you've ever seen the red shoes ballet, the girl that puts the, the ballet shoes on and then is fantastic but can't stop dancing, that's me, right? I can't stop dancing. She was always the grounding uh person. So she was writing and editing in the early days. And we moved out of New York to a, a little house, which I still live in, in New Hampshire. And we made the, the first film together on the Brooklyn Bridge um, in that a little cabin off the house, which I had to come in and start a wood stove. It was no insulation. We wore our coats until noon. Uh, it was, and she just sort of anchored it all in the best sort of way and, and went on to do that. We made a film on the Shakers together and then she edited a, a film on Huey Long and was an advisor. But by that time, my oldest daughter had been born and she really wanted to devote herself to what she thought was her best job as a professional mom. And she is the best mother I have ever, ever seen, ever mm -hmm. seen. And, uh, and very lucky. And it was her father who said, the wake, yeah. use the phrase wake the dead that you used before, yeah. which I thought so, was- So I had a kind of crisis in the early nineties and he's he was an eminent psychologist and I had talked to somebody and and it was very clear that, that the day that my mother had died, April 28th, was a day that approached all through my childhood and teenage years and early adulthood and then receded. I was never present for the day. And I never asked some really basic questions about her. I was- having the magical thinking and and my and I told this to my late father-in-law and he said well look what you do for a living you wake the dead and I said excuse me he said you make Jackie Robinson and Abraham Lincoln come alive who do you think you're really trying to wake up and I'm very happy to say that if it was said by anybody else you could kind of dismiss it as dime source psychology but he was an expert and very well-known psychologist and so uh it it had and he said I bet you you blew out your birthday candles wishing she'd come back and I said yeah how'd you know and he listed a few other things that I had done and he saw you know the trauma of a kid who at three years old barely having memories is aware that something is terribly wrong in the family and you know and she's about to die all the time and does die just a few months short of my 12th birthday mm. when I was 11. So he understood how, the traumatic nature of that experience, the PTSD that you go through and, and still go through. And so, you know, it still manifests itself, I'm sure, in, in difficulty to people, but it actually makes me better at what I do. And what I do, I think, is at least try to wake the dead, as, as Jerry said. Yes. Well, with that, I think we should go look at the pictures because then we can talk after that about archives and and his and teaching history and how you do that. My late father would have loved this book because he didn't like to read text. So this yeah. book, as I've sat and looked at it all week, it is like a Ken Burns film without narration. It's incredible. Right. Well, it was I. This was this is again kind of like flying without a parachute. This was the idea that you would, 
you would have, first of all, like a like the all the hundreds of aperture and other photography books that Jerry had in his office weighing down this the 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 shelves were sagging from the weight of these big books. And I would go in there and I just look at them and sit in a comfortable chair in his office and stuff would happen. And I would just look at these things, uh, mm. Walker Evans and Andre Cortez and Bernice Abbott and Dorothea Lang and and Helen Levitt, and all these really, really great photographers. Um, you know, we just we just ate it up and it was Cartier-Bresson, all, all of that stuff. And so I always thought that if I did a photography book, and on, many of my books have companion books, and there's text and pictures in there, and sometimes a picture gets a full page, that if I had control, I would have one picture per page, one picture on the other page. They would talk to each other just by virtue of their association. So the first picture is on the recto, the right-hand side. So there's nothing opposite it but a quote mm. from my far back ancestor, the poet Robert Burns. And then the last picture is also on the left side and there's nothing on the right. But all the remaining, the hundreds of remaining photographs are talking to us about themselves, but also in concert with their neighbor. And sometimes it might be about similar architecture, smokestacks and uh, big cactus in the Southwest, you know, but, but I wanted that to happen, but I also didn't want to deny people that everything says like New York city, uh, 1863, you know, I didn't want to deny people just at least a foothold of that thing, like a caption, you know, and you know what it's like, everybody on earth knows sometimes they spend more time reading the caption of the painting at the, in the museum yes. than looking at the painting. And so I wanted to make this so minimalist that you might have to drink in that. And then at the back, what we call the back matter is essentially a thumbnail photograph of each one of those photographs with now a detailed story, sometimes about the picture, sometimes about the photographer, sometimes about the age in which the photograph was taken, but something that actually helps you. And I imagine people going through it, looking at each thing and then going through it again and reading a little bit about this and maybe stopping for a while, maybe leaving it and, and coming back. Um, and and I, I've had this idea as I said, for years and years and years. And then it was really one of my oldest uh, uh, colleagues, Susanna Steisel, who I just said, let's let's just try to do this. And she was great. She was already one of the folks digging for photographs um, after I sort of got too busy to do that on every film. And she was really good at it. So we just started putting together and letting the pictures talk to each other and saying, nah, that didn't work. We wanted, we basically knew that we weren't gonna do color. We were going to be, by the time we got to about the time I went to Hampshire College, we were now going to be just impressionistically, just a handful of images. We weren't going to try to document the present, but we would take the first picture taken in the United States and we would represent every state and try to represent either directly or indirectly every film that we've done. So sometimes there are images from films we've done. Lot, most of the images are not, but they might refer to a subject that we've, we've covered. We, ne we didn't have any kind of um, thou shalt not. We just needed to be inclusive. And I just felt it was important that every one of the 50 states be represented because it was our America. And as I admit in the introduction, you know, it's actually my America. It's completely <laughs> subjective. But what I wanted was to show a complexity to the American story, that it was not just all fun and games and exceptionalism. Uh, and it's not all dark either. And right. so there's playfulness and there's um, real seriousness in this. And there's great natural beauty, which is of course always threatened by the by the acquisitive hand and, and the sort of the, the human nature that always looks at a beautiful forest and thinks bored feet or looks at a river and thinks hydroelectric power or looks at a canyon and wonders what mineral wealth can be extracted from it. We're extractive and acquisitive and that that's a dangerous thing. So it's it's celebrating a, a lot of things, good and bad about who we are. There's lots of construction. I loved all of that, the the, the genesis of so much. Let's see, let's see some of the pictures. Great. Well, you know, this is the United States Capitol. Um, that was um, a, an amazing shot. It's by a guy named John Plum Jr., who was a daguerreotype guy. He had a, 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 a 
a studio in Boston. And, and it was funny because our appetite for daguerreotypes waxed and waned and, and people went out of business. Matthew Brady went out of business. In fact, his collection is at the Library of Congress, which I use in this filming for our Civil War series, because when he went bankrupt, he just you know, nobody would do anything. And somebody in Congress took pity on him and appropriated a few thousand bucks to <laughs> sort of get him out of the hole. And we ended up, you and I own, you know, these fa fantastic photographs. But in this case, he also went belly up. He actually uh, committed suicide, but it's such a beautiful thing. There, there were already plans underway. This is 1846 to remodel the Capitol to look more like it was. But if you can think about the early days of the Republic for the first, you know, 10 12 presidents this is the the capitol building to which the legislative branch mm. operated out of and it's it's just it's so striking to think oh that's us too our, our capital yes yes so this is uh from casanova new york right it's um 1850 i think oh yeah. yes of course it's 1850 uh because it's a debate among several groups of people, mostly abolitionists. There's a man named Garrett Cole there, who's one of the more famous abolitionists of the, at the time. But you will see also a very young, striking black man. And that is Frederick Douglass, who bought himself out of slavery and became one of the most articulate spokesmen in the history of the United States about the evils of slavery. And the Fugitive Slave Act was an attempt that was passed that year that was was put together to mollify the South and the South rammed it through. They had a great deal of congressional domination at that time uh, to basically stem the tide of all of the uh, enslaved people who were making their way north through the Underground Railroad and, and just running away. So what they wanted to do is set a series of punishments that permitted them to come into the North and retrieve their property as they as they considered the enslaved people. And of course, it is this group of people, white and black, that remind us of the nobility of all human life and will end up prosecuting the Civil War once the South secedes and fires on a federal uh, installation at Fort Sumter, also a photograph in this uh, book, and and restore the Union. And so just to Frederick be- Douglass is, is just great. But just sorry to interrupt, just no. to be technical for a second, in 1850, you have to wonder what it was like to, first of all, tell these people that a picture is being taken of them because yeah. it wasn't a common it's occurrence. A, it's, it's a new thing. And you've got to understand up until this time, there's very few what we would call genre paintings. It's begun in the 19th century, but they're not paintings of how people are in everyday life. Photography changes it. But for the most part, the photographer is taking a portrait of you just as if you were fairly well to do you could have a portrait made of you a painting portrait mm -hmm. and so you're serious you're presenting this this side then all of a sudden events start happening and you start having well let's before we break up this meeting let's take a picture and so you have something like this and I, I don't think you can play down how important it is that they took a second or two literally with a long exposure time to stop and say we were here right. and that require that gives us the evidence now not for this book but to tell important stories that are behind this so photographic it, photographically it has an, a wonderful value and then i think once you learn the stories behind it 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 gains value as well and as i said in the introduction to the book you know, the cliche is a picture is worth a thousand words. And because there's so many and so misused today and so self-involved, you know, um, it, it, maybe it's lost its valuation. Maybe it's only 500. Maybe it's only 250. Maybe it's only two bucks. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And this, this book, one of the main, one of the many, many objectives of this book is to try to return full value to a single photograph, to allow it to complain, convey its complex uh, information without undue manipulation. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, so this is this is a photograph by Timothy O'Sullivan, who, who was one of the guys in Matthew Brady's gang of photographers. Often these are all just called Matthew Brady photographs. And this is um, taken in 1863 after the greatest battle in North America, if not the Western Hemisphere, which is the Battle of Gettysburg, which took place on the first, second and third day. I believe these are the dead at the end of the second day. I believe mm. this is the wheat field or the peach orchard. Uh, and it's just, um, 
an extraordinary photograph um, because it's all Americans killing Americans. And the other photograph that goes with this, which is not shown and won't be shown, is, is a photograph taken just a week or so later of people reading the list of the dead from Gettysburg on a newspapers, uh, sort of outside of the front of a newspaper, which is listing it. It's a whole crowd of people in New York City. And after that, the draft is instituted and there are draft riots in, in New York City in which exhausted troops that are making their way back from Gettysburg have to put down in which people just rebel and say and, and go after black people in New York and 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 kill them and and black orphanages uh, because they don't want to be drafted into the army. They don't want to fight for the liberation of the black man. Remember um, the previous September uh, in September of 62, Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which went into effect on January 1st, 63, which, you know, was made it not about union, but made it as much a moral higher moral uh, reason for, for fighting the war. So it's so, so complicated. And, and yet human beings, every one of those has a mother who just lost a son uh, in the greatest battle ever fought in North America. Uh, 50,000 casualties, at least 5,000 dead. Uh, it's the turning point of the war. It's a decisive Union victory. And there have been very, very few of them uh, up to this point, particularly in, in the important Eastern theater. So it's, it's just hugely important. And the idea that the mothers had to wait because technology wouldn't allow the conveying of information. Okay, let's go to that next one. Sorry. No, no, no. And that's true. I mean, there's a telegraph and it's getting the news back and it depends on how quickly your regiment is able to reconfigure and count the dead and figure it out. It's going to be much more difficult in the South, which doesn't have the infrastructure. So if, if you're a Southern soldier, you may never know. He just, Johnny just doesn't come home, period. And he's buried there. There's there's the mm. cemetery, famous cemetery of Gettysburg is filled with unidentified uh, remains from that battle. So this is one of my favorite favorite photographs of all time. One of the things that the Emancipation Proclamation, one of, I don't think it's an unintended consequences, but it wasn't anticipated, is that Lincoln would then say, if, if we're fighting for the liberation, then these people can be good soldiers. And by the end of the war, nearly 200,000 Black men had signed up. And I remember a wonderful story. This is the fourth U.S. colored uh, uh, regiment. And uh, they're always led by white men. You know, everybody's seen the movie Glory. It has that kind of uh, problem. But there was a great moment when one soldier re ended up returning to his former plantation in Virginia or someplace and killed his overseer, the, the man who had been most brutal to him. And uh, another soldier said at the time, looking at the befuddled faces of the people that had once run every aspect of his life and never paid him a cent for his labors that were often, you know, were always six days a week, 14 hours a day, unless there was a full moon where you worked longer. Um, he just said, bottom rail on top, NASA, mm. bottom rail on top. And it's, um, you know, the nobility and the sacrifice. And of course, you can imagine how they were treated by the Confederate soldiers, massacred, dumped into graves, not exchanged. And in fact, the South stopped exchanging officers that were captured, white officers that were captured once black soldiers began to fight. And Robert Gould Shaw, who led the f famous 54th Massachusetts that was part of the movie Glory, uh, his body was tossed in among the dead black soldiers of his regiment. And his father back in Massachusetts said, I'm proud that he was buried with them. Mm. And, uh, you know, this is part of the complicated stuff that's still going on today. I mean, right. this is the dynamic that is us, our America. Yes. Yes. Mm. All right. The wow. last portrait that Lincoln ever sat for, he would be assassinated a few days later. Oh. It's my favorite portrait of him. Um, Walt Whitman said, he's so awful, ugly, he's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln himself used to joke. He said, if I ever saw a man homelier than me, I'd shoot the wretch and put him out of his misery. But he's beautiful. And you can see the fact that he contains all of us in him. I'm going to cry. He's holding glasses. It's, it's an incredible thing. And somehow one of the prints of this, the negative cracked and there's a crack in it by his head. And, um, you know, he just... And, and he's shot in the head a, a, a few days later, but it's just so beautiful. The entire 
story of the United States is in his face, in the lines of his face, in the poetry of the words that he spoke, in in his demeanor, in his humor, in his um, up from nothing beginnings. Um, he's about as good as it gets. Do we know why he was sitting? What why the portrait well, was made when well, it was? Well, we, you know, he's the president of the United States. You're not going to make him stand. They did have these things that would hold Oh, no, him. I meant why was the picture being taken? Oh, it's just because he was the president. And I think the war was almost over. And I think there was a way. And and the photographers of that time, you know, they're, they're you want to have your photograph taken. It's not like they come to you and they do a snapshot. He I, he went to, to Gardner's studio, I believe, and, and sat for this. And there may be a brace behind his head holding him still for the long interior exposure time that it would take to make this photograph. But I don't know of a more beautiful portrait in, in American history. We have several in the book of, of famous people and not so famous people, but um, this is about as good as it gets as a person in the United States and um, as beautiful a, a portrait as I've ever seen. Mm. Startling. Yes. Oh, and this one too. Wow. Okay. So this is uh, New York Harbor. We are dedicating the Statue of Liberty. I think it's the 28th. Oh gosh. I'm not sure. Maybe I should look it up of October. Um, I think that's right. And um, Grover Cleveland is the president. If you get in real close, you'll see that there's a sheet in front of her eyes. And the president was supposed to pull the cord that would release this sheet at the moment when the fireworks and the and the bands play. But as you see, it's a kind of a misty uh, day and 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 the steam from the steamboats that have crowded in there are are sort of obscuring the view. It's 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 a really great photograph. In fact, our film, uh, the U.S. and the Holocaust, after a short prelude, begins with this photograph coming out of the water up the harbor and you hear Emma Lazarus' poem. There was nothing mentioned that day about welcoming immigrants. This was a symbol of freedom and liberty, a gift from the French, as the British said, who had too little to America that had too much. And um, it's a it's it's just one of my favorite photographs too of all time. And I've used it in, in many films, including a film I made on the Statue of Liberty and how it was, but, but that was the moment that it was uh, dedicated and somehow the cues got wrong and the bands started playing and the chord was ripped before before Grover Cleveland uh, could do it. And so it's just a classic American kind of mishmash, but it went off and a good time was had by all. Hmm. And there's another wonderful statue photo of a yes. statue getting put together. That yes, is so great. We, we just forget about it. First of all, it was built in France. It was constructed in France in this neighborhood that had, you know, nothing in it. And it towered over everything. It didn't have a base, which is almost the same height as the statue, literally almost the same height as the statue. And the Americans built that and they ordinary people and school kids had to contribute pennies and it was it was done. And Joseph Pulitzer of the of the world um, was the one who launched the public relations campaign to do that. But it then was disassembled all these copper molded sheets and the iron uh, the, the iron sort of structure uh, that Gustav Eiffel, who would later go on to build a, a, a tower of some fame and renown. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, it got it got disassembled and sent across the sea in a boat called the Isaire, and it nearly sank in a storm. And it arrived at Bedloe's Island. That's no longer it's not yet Liberty Island. It's once been a place where there's paupers' graves, and and it's just it's a it's a wonderful complicated American story. And so there are pictures pieces of the of the of the thing, including the face, which is another photograph we show in this tour of the United States to raise money. The the arm and the torch is sent to Philadelphia. It's 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 pretty wild, and in very abstract because all of a sudden you're you're looking at a big ear or big lips or an eye, and uh, all of these are just part of this enormous American jigsaw puzzle made by the French. I have to just interrupt this all by saying to you that when I saw your film about the Statue of Liberty, I grew up in Brooklyn. I got married in 1988 at Liberty Island because I it made me, you just deepened my love of the statue that I had grown up looking at. And my marriage didn't last, but my love of the Statue of Liberty has endured. Yeah, that's, <laughs> but that's, it was all because of you. So there you well, go. <laughs> that this is the this is the gal we we should always remember. I mean, one of the things I've said after the Holocaust film, since authoritarianism is on the rise everywhere, including here, that the time to save a democracy is before it's before. Lost. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Oh, this is one of the great places. I remember visiting here the first time. This is Mesa Verde in the south, kind of western, south central, southwestern uh, part of Colorado. It represents um, the the village of this. It's on a place called Mesa Verde, Green Green Mesa. And um, it's a whole town in there. And it's just mm. amazing. It was for a long time called the Anasazi, but that's, we found out as a fairly derogatory term. And so we've uh, grouped together all the tribes of the Southwest who are probably related in some ways at that time and call them ancient Puebloans because they made their own Pueblos, their own villages this way. And Chaco Canyon, in addition to Mesa Verde and many, many dozens of other sites around the Southwest are still preserved and intact. And this is the Mesa Verde community is pretty early. They may have come as early as 500 AD to this area. Mm. The flourishing really takes place up until about 1200 when they begin to uh, move away for reasons we don't know. We don't know whether it's climate change, whether it's illness, um, whether there's um, wars uh, with other tribes but they just kind of vanish and uh, there's reappearances of tribes but they're not precisely the same way and of course we have many southwestern tribes like the the Hopi and the Zuni and the Navajo and and others that are are part of this tradition but yet not of this group we call the ancient Puebloans and this is just a remarkable look at it you climb down as a visitor to Mesa Verde National Park you climb down ladders to get into this built into the side of a cave. You can't come up from the bottom. This is like the perfect, perfect place. You're hidden. You could drive right by it and not know that there was a entire little city, a little village down there. Well, that's what I'm wondering is the person who made this photograph, where, how did they get the equipment to this? Because oh. the equipment was big then too. Yeah, they had to haul it down. And I, I and I, in fact, it's funny that you said that because I was thinking about this a couple of days ago, this photograph, and I was realizing maybe there was a pulley, maybe the ropes were were how down and you brought the, the sticks and the, and the big, huge, bulky camera. It's by a, a, a photographer named Gustav Nordenskoid or Skold, something mm. like that. And, um, you know, this was the this was when the West was this phenomenal attraction for everybody. This is the 1890s. And, uh, you know, people are coming from all over Europe. It's it's where many European countries get a fascination with the Wild West, all the fraudulent mythologies of gunslingers and stuff like that, but also the nobility of the native peoples, the original, the buffalo. I'm just working on a film about called The American Buffalo about the near extinction of that animal and its return and its and its life cohabiting with Native Americans for 10,000 years before white people came in and um, interrupted that process. Mm. I love this picture. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't know anything about this. Um, uh, I know the photograph is a guy named W.B. Davidson, but it's and it's in um, Jamestown, Rhode Island. And these are um, two gals having a good time. They look like I it. Just, <laughs> I just I just wanted, you know, it speaks to the era. This is would be considered probably a pretty risque bathing suit. Mm -hmm. There's their stockings in addition to Oh, not maxi, but pretty far midi kind of skirts and whatever. But that was, they're showing a lot of leg for the time and they're having a good time. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's part of the book is not all, you know, the story of us is, is also, you know, kids, you know, putting on six shooters and, and, and playing around and having a good time and a lot yep. of this. Yeah. Moments I love it. Of repose. It's, it's jo yeah. joyful. Yeah. Oh, so the same architects, Heinz, Hein, Hein, and Lafarge, that built the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, still under construction, by the way, in yeah. New York City, uh, up on Morningside Heights, uh, also designed this, which is arguably the most beautiful subway station. It's the City Hall subway station. It's the first subway station. It is the first station of the first 
company, the the IRT, which those of us of a certain age used to call the different lines. You didn't say the MTA, you said the IRT, which meant you were taking the Interborough Rapid Transit Company trains, which were the one, the two, uh, and the three, the four, the five, and the seven, or you were taking the independent transit, which is the A and the C and the and now the E and or the or the BMT, the Brooklyn BMT. Manhattan. Transit. Mm -hmm. So those were all kind of merged. They were separate, independently owned companies. But within the the day that this opened, 150,000 people rode on the subway. There was people described the crush of it. It was sort of like a football rush. They talked about it, you know. And but but please just step back for a moment and look at the beauty of this. And it's paired with the Cliff House, this beautiful drawing, sort of uh, a, a building clinging to the side of the Pacific Ocean. Yes, Cisco. And it, it it's not spectacular in its architectural beauty, but it's just in the act of faith that it represented. It's long since gone, burned down or 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 destroyed by storms or whatever. But I sort of put them, this subway station, as you can imagine, is not still in use, but apparently I'm told you can go and find it if you've found the right MTA employee to, <laughs> to take you down to that place. But uh, how great is that, right? How it's beautiful is that? Gorgeous. And are those Guastavino tire tiles? I don't know. They, but they, look like they, it. They, they 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 could very easily be. I I don't know. It just to me, you just it's just. I was this morning. I was in the great reading room of the Library of Congress, right? And you you just go. This is. It looks like a cathedral. It looks like a church. It looks like a temple. And what it is not to the subjective teachings of a particular religion. It's to the increase of knowledge and the pursuit of truth. And it makes you want to cry. It's so powerful. And then there's this, which is <laughs> the same attention to detail to this American idea of commerce. Let's move people around as fast as we can move them. And you know what? We're so big and we're so crowded in this biggest city in North America, this now biggest city in the world, that we're going to move people underground, you know, New York, New York, a wonderful town, the Bronx is up and the batteries down and people ride in a hole in the ground. There's the first hole in the ground. New York, New York. Right? Yep. You got it. You got it. I love it. Okay. So this is uh, one of my favorites. This is in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. This is taken by the great muckraking photographer. Muckraking is a uh, is not an important adjective. The great photographer, Lewis Hine, who influenced a good deal of what I've been interested in, influenced Jerry Liebling and his, these are kids uh, rummaging through um, a garbage heap, trying to find stuff. Um, there is extraordinary wealth in the United States and there's extraordinary poverty. And this is a time when we are trying to figure out what kind of country we are. You know, do we live in um, Bedford Falls or do we live in Pottersville? And for most mm -hmm. of it, we've been extractive. You know, the, the robber barons and the trusts and the monopolies have made literally millions and millions and workers are paid very little. So this is the beginning of the movement towards unionization. But you can see where it comes from, the abject poverty in what is by then one of the richest, soon to become the richest country on earth. And what year is this, Ken? Heartbreaking. It's early aughts, I think. Uh, let me just... 1912 is what I'm being told. Yes, 1912. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. Great. Yeah. And I'll... Does it... The little kids <clears throat> look so contemporary. Yep, they do. And and I think we know this and we understand, you know, Sitting Bull was hired by Wild Bill Cody to come and be an attraction in his Wild West show, which drew millions, you know, this big three hour outdoor extravaganza. And after a few months, he just sort of quit. He couldn't understand why there were people begging on the streets of when everybody was so well to do and you know he gave his money away his salary to hobos and newsboys you know mm. and then he went back and spent the rest on his friends back on the reservation mm. uh, it's just you know it's heartbreaking that that this occurs but it's this is true but it's it's part of what the dynamic is the balance that we keep trying to achieve in our country yes Ah, Memphis, Tennessee. This is much later. This is like 1935, I believe. We're in the middle of the Depression. 
Uh, the resettlement um, administration is trying to help displaced people, displaced by the greatest economic cataclysm in the history of the world, find new homes. And part of the many programs of the New Deal is the FSA, the Farm Security Administration. And they sent out, they hired many of the great photographers that we know of, Dorothy Lang, Walker Evans, and in this case of this photograph, uh, Ben Sean, uh, who's also a painter, right, and a collagist. And he's, he's uh, taken this picture. It's in Memphis, and this is a blind fiddler. Uh, with his audience, and Gordon Parks was part of that, and um, it's just, mm. I just love it. I love the intensity of her look. I love the accidental background information, the person looking off to the side, the sign, the car, and yet it's almost you hear what he is playing, and his concentration is so interior. Um, you may be able to see in the photograph that he's blind or not, but you'll find out when you go back to the back material and hear the backstory. Um, but you know the my, the famous photograph of the migrant mother, Dorothea Lang's most famous photograph, yeah. is taken by the United States government. That you know they had people write guides to every state, which you can still use. Um, they put writers to work. Uh, they put playwrights to work. They, they did so much back then during the depression to lift everyone out, not just the great public works programs and the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps that rebuilt and remade and, and uh, a lot of our national parks, uh, but the FSA was there to document it. Who are we is the central question of it. Just bring back Roy Stryker, the boss was, just bring back who we are. And so we come back in all of our um, glory uh, mm -hmm. And and I think what it reminds you and what photography is so good at is reminding you that there's no ordinary people, right? We we say that we live in a bold faced celebrity culture, you know. But and there's images of famous people in this, but there's as much dignity in the lives of people that are not known, and they are all extraordinary. There are no ordinary people. Yes. And Speaking this. of, yeah. So look at this guy, you know, great. <laughs> he may be, he may be alive, right? I wish I knew who he was. Um, so this is taken by my mentor, Jerome Liebling, Jerry Liebling in 1949 in New York city. There is so much about this photo photograph to commend itself. First of all, just his attitude, his being, the fact that he is equal to the photographer, or in this case, something that Jerry told us is that don't, you know, there's no communication except among equals. You know, you cannot put yourself above it. There is a responsibility. Susan Sontag, in a kind of binary way, described the taking of photography as a kind of an appropriation. And it can be, but it doesn't have to be. And you, he, you see here the equality of subject and photographer. They're yeah. there. And look at him, this, this, this hat, the coat that he's holding, the, the, you know, the tied together, barely tied together shoes. He's wearing a hockey shirt. Those are hockey players, right? Hockey. And, and the curve of the car, all of this just speaks to a, a spectacular and decisive moment of, of, you know, Jerry used to say to all of us, go see, do, be, go out into the world see, look, just don't have your own set of opinions. Don't be lost in your own narcissism. Go see, do, take a photograph, make a film, do something, right? And be, be present. And you can feel all of those things in the making of this photograph and why for thousands of reasons, one of thousands of reasons, it graces the cover. And grace is the only word that I could describe the cover of, of this book. And I'm very sad that Jerry's not around to see the book. He undoubtedly criticized a lot of stuff about it, but <laughs> he was that way and he kept you honest. Uh, but I think he'd be pretty proud that that uh, we put his beautiful photograph, his, of many, many photographs. And he took photographs in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the aughts and even into the early um, teens. Um, just a great legacy of photography. Well, and maybe 
it being on the cover of your book. We'll find out who he is and where, yeah, what happened is, to him. This is what happened. So we had some footage in the Holocaust film. Uh, it's footage and it's, we're trying to take the onus off the opacity of 6 million. You say 6 million means nothing to people. So we change that dynamic around and we say in 1933, when the Nazis came to power, there were 9 million Jews in Europe. By the time of the end of the Second World War in 1945, two out of three had been killed. And you see this young, attractive woman looking through a window. And then she's joined momentarily by what looks like to be a mother and a father, but a male and another older female. And they pull in and pull out. So it's almost like we're saying, it's those three that were there at the beginning and it's only her left over. We just heard from her daughter. She escaped, she got out, she's alive. We now know stuff about her and it is just one of those great things. I mean, every once in a while, you know, in World War II, we said, I think my dad is in that footage that you had there. Can you tell us where you found it and exactly what the provenance is? And, and we go to that. It's just, it's one of the extra lanyaps, they say in New Orleans, the extra added dessert from doing these films is that suddenly you, you, the people you work with, your friends for life, but, but sometimes people come out of the woodwork and they say, that's my mom. And the, you know, it's just so great. And so I hope somebody says, that's me or that's my dad. Yes. You know? Yes. But let's talk about that for one moment about, or more than a moment about archives in general. We've talked a lot about, you've talked a lot about the power of photography, but what about where we are today with all of the technological changes that we've had, um, having done lots of archival research myself, different than yours, I, I go into those places, the Library of Congress with reverence for this art of archiving. What happens now that we have all this digital matter? I'm sure people have asked you this before. Well, I what think- do you tell your granddaughters? Just, yeah, well, you know, it's funny. Um, if you read what people said after the telegraph came in, in the 1840s, 50s, I think, it's like, it's all over. It's the death of everything, right? And so we're always saying that TV was gonna be the death of the movies, right? Sure. Um, so what happens is, is that human nature doesn't change. Human nature digests whatever technology is available, right? If you're coming back and you're painting the story of your hunt on the cave, that's what you're doing. And then we saw this, woolly mammoth and then we killed this woolly mammoth and that's why we're eating for the next six months right mm -hmm. or the next month whatever it might be um and then maybe somebody's got a printed book and you're sitting around by candlelight and you're reading the bible the king james bible you know and and your family is gonna produce the 16th president of the united states reading shakespeare and the king james bible and then all of a sudden you're gonna have letters that travel fairly quickly in a postal system, which is in our constitution to have good post roads, you know, to get the mail through. And it's gonna move all the way up to the same time. So it's just gonna be, we just are adapting to new and different technologies. You know, we may be downloading, you know, somebody's hard drive filled with thousands and thousands of photographs to understand who they were because they haven't written a letter. They've just written texts and photographs. And you'll say, well, that's, you know, not as literate. No, but there may be something in those photographs that, that speak volumes, you know, the back to a picture worth a thousand words. You know? No doubt that people are communicating more than ever. And then there are more ways to communicate than ever. It's the archival uh, part. It's yes. the saving of it part. Yeah. That well, you notice we're, we're having a big debate now about presidential records and what, you know, right. who they are. And um, a lot of that, we're talking about digital archives, you know, that from, right. you know, the Bush administration on uh, is, is, you know, very an important aspect. And, and most of the stuff is digital. So it's on relatively small amount of space where you take the papers of a particular president and, you know, they're, they're truckloads of thousands and thousands of boxes generated and still lots of paper is generated. But now, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, the digital record, which has its, it's, it's just different. Just imagine what the world was like without the photographs that, that this, you know, the first guy, the first photograph taken in the United States, and then it goes on. So all the whole course, the whole arc of this book, they're just black and white still photographs, but boy, stuff has changed since the beginning of that book. 
I want to ask just as we wrap up about your two older daughters, because Mm -hmm. I see one of course is, is a documentarian and the other has gone Hollywood, more Hollywood. And she recently got an incredible promotion um, and, and is dazzling. And it's so interesting to see your early ambitions to go Hollywood. Now it's skipped a generation and she, yeah. has, she hasn't literally no. gone to Hollywood. She hasn't literally gone. She lives, literally. In Brooklyn. she lives in Brooklyn. So that's, you know, that's where I was born. So that, <laughs> that, that, that is, uh, I suppose, a saving grace. No, my oldest daughter, Sarah, has been working with me for a long time. First of all, she was crawling under the editing table in diapers. And so she She's been there and watched a lot of films being made and watched her mother edit. And um, she's just a fantastic. So we made, she got out of college wanting to go into law, but she had Mm. uh, found out about the Central Park Five and wanted to write a book. And she wrote a book about them. Everybody else wrote a book about the crime and how horrible these then boys were, five black and Hispanic men now. Um, and she befriended them and wrote a beautiful book about it. And as I was sort of her editor at the beginning, informal editor, I just said, oh my God, we have to make a movie. So she and her husband, Dave McMahon, who is also, um, or her husband-to-be, who has been working for me for several years, um, the three of us made the Central Bar Five, and then we went on to make Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali. We're working on a film right now. They're, they're in Florence, uh, Italy for a year, uh, making a film about Leonardo da Vinci, and um, and then we're working on a film uh, called Emancipation to Exodus about reconstruction and the years leading up to it and the years leading a- after it to when African-Americans began to leave the South in great numbers, a six decade long exodus called the Great Migration. Anyway, we're, we're working on lots of films together. And my second daughter, Lily, um, has been part of a, a production house of her with her husband, uh, Jack's Media, and they got bought out by uh, Imagine Entertainment. And then the two principals of Imagine, uh, Brian Grazer and Ron Howard, sort of kicked themselves upstairs for however long they'll be able to tolerate that and let Lily and Tony, who everything they touched, Broad City, Search Party, Samantha B, Jesus and Mero, you know, all these great, great things that they've they've put on across basic cable, premium cable, movies, stuff like that has, has I don't want to say turned to gold because that makes it sound just about money. They've, they've just been creatively terrific. And this is also uh, a little girl who grew up around editing tables and helping in over the summer on, on films. And I've never pushed any of them, but Sarah uh, majored in American studies at Yale and Lily majored, double majored at Columbia in film and history. So you know, somewhere the apples don't fall far from the tree. And I'm very, very proud of them. They are their own uh, great filmmakers in their own rights and spectacular human beings. And it's exciting. You've not only influenced a whole generation of filmmaking and history making, but in your own family. It's- yeah, it's, it's pretty funny because, you know, I did it without trying. I'm not one of those parents to say, oh, you have to go to this place or you have to do this. It's like whatever you want to do. Emerson says in his essay in Self-Reliance, do whatever inly I-N-L-Y, whatever in Lee rejoices. And that's what I've said to all my girls. I have two other ones uh, in the pipeline, as we would say in the film. <laughs> And 17 and 12. And uh, all of them are showing interest in history and or filmmaking. And so um, I'm powerless to stop it, but I am not, I promise you, Scouts Honor, encouraging it. Well, since we both went to Hampshire College, I would be yes. hard pressed to imagine that you'd be that kind of parent. But no, you know, right, those exactly. out there listening to this who don't know all about that Hampshire ethos, we will you're you're on the record as saying you're not meddling with the, their futures that way. Oh, no. no, and Hampshire is about, I mean, I I don't recognize the person who uh, went into Hampshire, Lisa. Uh, in September of 1971 and the person that came out in 1975. It just rearranged all my molecules. You know, what's so sad about higher education today is that it's become so transactional. You know, you acquire a college like it's a retail experience, like you just bought a Louis Vuitton handbag, right? <laughs> it, should be, it should be transformational. And Hampshire was transformational. It rearranged, exa- I mean, you would not have known, you would not know who I am. We would not be talking 
had I not gone to Hampshire College. And that's a combination of how it is con constructed and, and arranged and it still is and still going strong and who the teachers were and what they challenged me to do. I mean, I'm not passive in it, but it needed that environment to, to ignite something that is now the recognizable me, just as the person who walked in, I, I don't really, I remember that person, but it, it, it doesn't bear a lot of resemblance to who I am. And uh, I owe that all to Hampshire. Well, it was a combustible moment in time for you and all the people you encountered and we're all the better for it. And you legitimized Hampshire to my father, who was very skeptical of it. Thank you for that. <laughs> and um, that, that's just on my personal note, but on a bigger note, congratulations on this book and all else. It's really exciting to see. And it's been a delight to plow through. And it's one of those things I'll go back and back and back yeah. to so many times, which is I, was, I know I what was, you intended. I was sitting. Thank you so much. I was just sitting with my little one the other day and just going through the book. We maybe got 10 pages because they had questions and whatever. And then, of course, somebody texted or, you know, they needed to get on this or that and disappeared. But it was so wonderful that it was something, you know, it was literally this book, you know, we're sitting there going, you know, we'll 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 just go through a couple of pictures and she'd say, what's this? You know, why, what, what, why was this picture in and tell me about this. And all of a sudden you're opening up and I go back and we go to the back matter. And that, then I found her looking through it, going to the back <laughs> matter to, to on her own to find out what her photograph was about. So it's exciting. And I hope it gives uh, other people pleasure the way it was. It took a long time to make many, many years to make, but it, it, it just was so exciting. We worked at night and on the weekends in the midst of doing all the films and, um, and not just Susanna Stiesel, who I mentioned before, but Brian Lee and David Blistein, uh, all of them, three colleagues who who played an enormous role in making sure this book came into existence. And our publisher, Alfred Knopf, with the, my late editor, Sonny Mehta, who passed away a number of years ago, my current editor, uh, Andrew Miller, who just had faith in it when it was just, you know, I think this is what I kind of want to do and put stuff together. And they're like, uh-huh, okay. And and they stuck with it. And, and I think they're proud of it too. So I hope people will enjoy it. And they can work out with it too, because it weighs. Yeah. Oh, it weighs a ton. It many does. many yeah. pounds. So <laughs> exactly. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Lisa. Special thanks to the owners of the copyrights for allowing us to embed these images in this video. Um, a reminder, Ken's book is Our America, A Photographic History. His book and Lisa's book are available wherever books are sold and signed copies of each of the books are available in the link below and the link in the comments section. Thanks, and as we like to say around here, please go on gently. <laughs>